the year. Well, Matthew, welcome to the Sports Editor. Absolute privilege to chat to you. Uh, a legend of the game of soccer in South Africa. So thank you so much, so much for your time. Really, really appreciate it. Matthew, you grew up in the, in the Western Cape. Um, and it's obviously a very good sort of setup here. The guys love football, soccer, really, really enjoy it. And it, it made you feel it at home here, didn't it? Yeah, no, it did. Uh, you know, growing up in Fishhook, um, we had a very well-established amateur club um, established in 1930 and was very well run, um, had a strong parental um, influence with um, a lot of uh, an atmosphere of, of, of volunteerism, you know. So uh, there's very few institutions like that anymore, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> so I was, I was very blessed in that regard. Uh, great environment for sport. In fact, that valley with Ocean View and Masipumalele and Fishhook have generated some fantastic athletes, um, uh, produced some fantastic athletes, and it's kind of hidden away. So um, a lot of the bigger clubs were not able to poach the players and athletes of that nature. Um, so yeah, quite a unique um, uh, area to grow up in. Yeah. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Brilliant. Because your professional career kicked off with, with Cape Town Spurs, and that must have been also a very good start for you, because they seem to have done a lot right at the time. And... You happy with with how your your career? I would say progress from that from the start. Then, yeah. Um, so there was a there is a prestigious uh, youth tournament called the Bay Hill uh, tournament, and uh, Fisher had a very good um, team at that time, and we managed to crack an invite. Um, and I basically got scouted there by uh, Mister Abre, who was the coach at Cape Town Spurs at the time. Um, and then I played two years of junior football. Um, before we got thrown in the deep end in 1996 and had my first uh, professional season. Uh, but those two, two years of junior football at Spurs, <clears throat> you know, I was training with um, some fantastic players. And so, you know, it's so important that a player arrives at, at the right club at the right time uh, and so that you can learn and progress um, maximally. And uh, there were some fantastic um, older players there who were, who were quite willing to pass on their knowledge. So um, only good times. Yeah. <laughs> That's excellent to hear. Only good times. That's brilliant. But you, I th I'd say you also had a good time in South Africa because you spent most of your career with um, Amalodi Sun Sundowns. Do you feel your career was maximized in South Africa for the time that you spent here? Um, yeah, I think, you know, um, it's every athlete's, want and dream to to be tested at the highest level so I would have loved to have played in a more established league uh, like the EPL or La Liga, La Liga. I did have opportunities um, but never quite uh, made it perhaps wasn't good enough uh, or had a very good week um, week's trial but then my club asked for too much money you know things didn't, just didn't happen um, so to to have retired at 37 uh, having played six years in, in Russia, uh, played for the national team, you know, um, I couldn't really have asked for more. Um, you know, I've had I've had a number of colleagues who were a thousand times more talented than me, but played half that time, you know. So, yeah, I, I would I would say that was maximized. Yeah, and I'm, I was looking back, you know, with hindsight, um, very grateful for, for what South African football uh, and the, the, the footballing community offered me. Absolutely brilliant. But talking about Russia, you played for, and I'm going to chunk this right, Rostov and Krulia Sovatov. Hey, rolls of the tongue. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> well done. Well done. <laughs> uh, yeah, so Krulia, Krulia Sovietov, um, it actually means the, the wings of the Soviets. Oh, wow. Um, and the reason, the reason why that is, is that Samara, where the team was based, uh, even during communist times, was a was a town that was shut off from basically the the entire country. It was where they manufactured their um, rockets and secret arms, and wow. um, it was where the the, rock, the, the, the space um, shuttle for Yuri Gagarin was built, and and so or hence the names uh, the, the the name Wing Krylia uh, Sovietov. Um, and yeah, it was a very interesting environment to go into um, where just walking down the street with my beard and bald head and uh, different clothes, um, 
you could be spotted a mile away as being a foreigner. So, uh, I, but I loved it. The, the cultural experience was fantastic. Yeah, I can imagine. But just talk to us about the start of football because you know, we, we get the pictures there of Russia being nice and cold and ice pitches and, and difficult conditions. And I'd say a bit of a rough league. Those guys aren't scared to you know, throw a tackle in or just be aggressive. It must have been a, a, a nice experience for you, but a bit tough at times, I'm sure, as well. Yeah, it's difficult to generalize about the league, just, to, just as it is about the country. Uh, I mean, you know, we used to fly to Vladivostok um, and it, it took about nine and a half, ten hours to get there and you were still in the same country, you know, uh, across six different time zones. Um, and the league, the league itself, you had teams were, who were hard, uh, physical, you know, played the ball down the channel, didn't, get, didn't waste time getting the ball, ball forward. Uh, and then you had teams who had a bit of a South American influence, you know, a Mediterranean infer, in, influence, um, who played out from the back, had some very skillful players. So it was a nice mix. Um, and I arrived there in 2002 when the Russian League, very similar to the MLS in the uh, uh, mid-90s, was uh, pumping their petrodollars into the league in an attempt to to up the status. Uh, so I, I played against um, you know uh, guys like Ivanovic, um, who played at Chelsea, you mm. know, came through from from Serbia via Lokomotiv, um, uh, Yuri uh, Yurishik, who played for Chelsea and and Rangers, uh, Wagner Love, you know, Brazilian international, you know, players of that stature. So. It turned out to be a fantastic move for me, um, mm. not only financially, but also um, uh, so as to develop my game more. And I definitely played some of my best football uh, while there. So would you say that basically that was the crux of, of, of your decision to say, right, I'm going to go to Russia because I know my game's going to improve, my skills are going to improve, it's a good move for me, A, eh? and play a bit in Europe, why not? Yeah, um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd gone on trial to West Ham in 2001. Uh, Harry Redknapp had really liked me. Uh, unfortunately, Mamelodi Sundowns asked for too much money. Uh, mm. So that fell through. I'd been in a number of other trials where I hadn't performed well or had done so, but for some reason just didn't go through. And it, I came to the stage of my career where I thought, well, if I've got to maximize my earnings, uh, you know, this is a very short career. I've got to make a move. And to be honest with you, I didn't know anything about the Russian League, uh, about the standard of living there. It was purely, at the time, a very mercenary um, uh, choice. Mm. Um, but, but I did understand that, you know, uh, it was part of Europe. Um, um, I played a couple of Europa Cup games, uh, which was also great for my CV. Uh, and so there was always a chance of, of, of still going. Um, while at Rostov, I picked up some interest from Valencia in Spain. Wow. Um, and so you were closer to the action, you know, uh, yes. in a league which was closely watched by um, the European scouts. So. No, excellent. That's excellent, Matthew. That's brilliant to hear. Yeah, you, you want to have these experiences while playing, you know, it's, it just keeps you going. It's awesome. Matthew, you, you, you're quite a short chap. Um, about two... <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> Two meters tall, six foot six, quite something. So you've obviously got an advantage over strikers. But I mean, this may be a common question, but it, it almost sort of like feels like you're perhaps like put in defense. Like, there we go, you're tall, go into defense. Is that something that you have a say in or is it just sort of, well, I am tall. That's where I have to go. It's just what it is. Yeah, we are, we are a bit like uh, goalkeepers, you know. Uh, you know, it's, uh, under, under six or under eight, um, there's goalkeepers... God bless them, but they, they, they are a special breed. And, you know, they, they have the stigma attached to them from that very young age where generally the, the fat kid or the kid that doesn't have any coordination gets put in the goals, you know. Uh, and likewise, defenders, um, I, I kind of played midfield um, when I was younger, but when I had my growth spurt, the coach uh, slotted me back in, in, into defense. Um, and and most good goalkeepers or defenders have played as a striker or has played as, mm. uh, as a, in, a, in an attacking role. So I think that that uh, benefited me um, when it when it came to defending. Uh, it gave you a a different outlook on what an attacker or attacking midfielder number ten might 
be attempting to do. So you're able to take that extra step to the left to, to cut off his shot or his passing line, you know. So mm. that, that, that it actually helped. And, and I always encourage players at a young age, you know, from 6 to 13, to play as many different positions as possible. Um, um, very similar to uh, South Africans playing many different sports at school, you tend to generate a very good, healthy, uh, holistic athlete. Um, so, yep. No, that's, that's a very good approach. And yeah, I absolutely agree with you. Playing as many positions as you can, it is essential, essential. But just going and look at, at being a defender and, you know, often the offside trap is, is what you aim for. But how much time at training do you actually spend on that? And then it's quite a difficult thing to, I'd say, master. Because, I mean, the strikers are jolly quick and the sort of through balls just give you a hard time. How much time do you spend on planning that offside trap? Yeah, look, um, you know, when, when, you, when you're perhaps 1-0 down and you're chasing the game, uh, it's the last five or ten minutes, uh, I think then you would, you would attempt the offside trap, you know, when the legs are a little bit tired. But it, I'm not, I was never really a fan of it. Um, mm. being, being quite a tall guy um, and not the quickest, um, my anticipation was always my weapon to, to counter that. So I'd always drop into spaces uh, where I could see the ball was coming. Um, if the ball was played into feet, I would have to get very quickly onto a striker and not let him turn and run at me. That was one thing that I absolutely hated was a, was a short, quick striker who <laughs> turned and started to run at me, you know. Um, and so practicing quick feet exercises at training uh, benefited me. I had to really work hard at that. Um, but yeah, offside trap, um, you know, especially early on in a game, it's not, it's not recommended. Mm. Um, but yeah, late on in the game, you know, it was a, almost like an act of desperation. Uh, but to come back to your, your question, when you're playing in a back four or back three, um, when you do play that offside trap, you've, you've almost got to work uh, telepathically. And that, that's why it always helps to play with the same defense uh, as, you know, the same faces alongside you as often as possible so that you can build up that uh, rapport. And I know we've been talking local sport, but that's just the first thing that came to mind there was, was Liverpool. Is that purely the problem with Liverpool is the, f- the fact that, I mean, they're with 17 different combinations for defence. I mean, you can't manage that. It's just, if you're building from the back, you just, how your strikers going to get the ball? It's all over the place. It's, it, do you think that that's what it comes down to with Liverpool? Yes, absolutely. And, uh, you know, we've seen it locally here where, uh, we have some fantastic um, attacking players, very creative attacking players. Uh, but the centre-back pairings have been the Achilles heel in a number of teams due to lack of consistency, uh, not because of the lack of ability. Um, and obviously, COVID has compounded that issue, um, you know, just like with Liverpool and a number of the EPL teams. Um, and then also, you know, when you look at Liverpool, um, you know, their insistence to play out from the back. Uh, and you, you see it in a number of teams where all of a sudden centre-backs are basically, they've become creative midfielders in a way that they have to um, transition, you know, and, and build up from the back and, and be very calm and composed uh, under pressure. And, you know, the fact that they haven't had a regular back four uh, has made the issue even even worse, Uh but yeah, I've been fascinated with the development of, of particularly fullbacks and centre-backs and their roles over the last uh, couple of seasons. And thanks to Pep Guardiola, centre-backs are not just the, considered to be the donkeys in the team anymore. They, they're, uh, they, they tend to have a bit of skill nowadays. <laughs> there you go. That's brilliant. That's actually brilliant. Uh, and talking about Liverpool, and again, do you being so tall, I reckon if you and Peter Crouch were on the same team, you'd be unstoppable. <laughs> yeah, he, um, you know, it, it just shows, you know, what a, what a beautiful game uh, this is. You know, you you can really be, you know, uh, thin, fat, you know, it doesn't matter what color you are or what language you speak mm. or what sort of athletic build you have. Um, if you have a footballing brain and you, and you train hard and you, you have the right technique, um, really anybody is able to play, you know. Um, and he 
he didn't have the physique of a footballer, um, yeah. but, but his his first touch for such a big guy um, always stood out for me. Um, amazing, amazing player, um, and for such a big lad, you know, you don't normally have such a, a, a great touch on you. Um, but it was no surprise that he had such a long career uh, and a prestigious one at that. No, absolutely, absolutely. But talking about prestigious, it's always an honor to represent your country. And you did that at under 20 and a 23, and obviously it's senior level. Um, and do you feel that that is that under 23 setup is crucial for development? Because, you know, not everyone makes it at 18. Some guys do develop when they're 23, 24. Do you feel that under 23 setup is still crucial for the development of the game? Yeah, it's, it's, it's crucial for, for our national senior men's team and women's team. Um, the main reason being um, when a player qualifies for a World Cup, a senior World Cup, uh, he doesn't arrive there, he or she doesn't arrive there with stars in their eyes. Um, you know, at, at youth level, when you play under 17 and 20 and then 23, you get an opportunity to play in a Junior Nations Cup or a, or a Junior World Cup. And that, that experience prepares you for uh, the bigger stage. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately for us, we did all of that. Um, World Youth Champs in 97, uh, African Nations Cup 97, um, and finally the Olympics uh, in 2000. Uh, but only four or five of us from that team actually went on to uh, represent Bafana Bafana on a regular basis. Mm. And that wasn't really good enough. And I just feel that when it comes to professional sport, there's just too many uh, gatekeepers, um, whether it be agents, technical directors, club owners, even uh, fans. You know, the pressure of fans can also do that. Uh, and I think that a coach uh, should be, and his, his staff uh, should really be the only ones that should be choosing a team uh, and hopefully doing it on, on merit. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. But Matthew, and, and um, I don't know how happy you are to chat about this, but it, it, you obviously experienced the World Cup in 2010, obviously great for the country, brilliant. But also I think a bit frustrating for you as well, because I think you would have loved to have a bit more involvement in, in the team, because it was so close, but agonizingly so far, you know, to, to going through to the next round. Uh, how did you sort of feel? I mean, you're happy to be part of the squad, but I feel you you want to be a bit more involved. Is it? Am I right in saying that? No, oh, without a doubt. Uh, mm -hmm. I was uh, freezing uh, on the bench with everybody else in that uh, stadium. It wasn't it wasn't pleasant to. I'm not a I'm not a. Throughout my career, I haven't I haven't sat on the bench much. You know, um, I feel I feel like a bit of a. A fraud, um, you know, sitting on the bench, not contributing to to the team. So, uh, having played all five games games in the Confederations Cup in two thousand and nine, having tested myself against Spain and Brazil, in who were number one and number two at the time in the world, um, it gave me a sense of confidence that I was able to compete at that level. So, with the change of coaching, uh, with Santana getting fired, and then. Uh, Pereira coming on board, I could see instantly that I was in a bit of trouble here um, and that uh, I was not one of his uh, favorites. And in fact, I was quite lucky to even make the squad um, only because Morgan Gould uh, got injured. Uh, was I included as the fourth center back? Um, so yeah, it was a difficult time. Um, I had to bite my tongue and try and convince him at training Try and try and change his mind, you know. Um, mm. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. Yeah, no, a tough one, a tough one. And uh, there's only so many words you can actually say to sort of say, you know, sorry, but yeah, I think you did well there just to remain calm. So, <laughs> well then, Matthew. <laughs> but overall, did you enjoy your time playing for South Africa? It must have been a jolly good experience. Yeah, no, I, I played my first. I got my first cap in '98. During my, my time in Russia, it was kind of out of sight, out of mind, and I didn't get a call-up. Um, and then I returned in 2008 um, and continued playing 28 caps. I would have loved to have played uh, more for my national team. Um, 
But that whole build-up to 2010 was fantastic. Uh, I'm just very happy that, well, a bit sad that we didn't qualify for the um, for the knockout rounds, but really ecstatic that uh, we as a nation was able to put on a great show. Uh, I don't know if you remember all the criticism leading up to the World Cup from particularly the British press and, you know, the, the doubting Thomases, but, you know, that's always a great feeling to, to prove uh, people wrong. And, yeah, it's something that we can always be proud of. Absolutely, absolutely. But, you know, we were chatting earlier a bit about the league and, and the, there's a lot of promise. There's a lot of talent coming through. There's abundance of players. The, I mean, everyone wants to play football. It's a growing sport. Um, but we, we sort of want to have a bit more success, I'd say. You know, we want to win a few more trophies here and there, which would be great. Winning more things like that. But wh what in your eyes is sort of missing? Well, why can't we just get over that hurdle and, and get there and win it more often than not? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we, we, a population of 58 million plus, um, we we should be winning uh, more trophies. We should be qualifying for a World Cup every four years. Um, we should be qualifying and getting into the last four, at least, of an African Nations Cup. Um, that hasn't happened uh, in a long time. And, and the reason, in my opinion, is that, uh, you know, it starts at uh, local football association level, LFA level. Uh, amateur football um, with regards uh, lack of f facilities, um, lack of coaching education, um, the, I think in society today, everybody wants to be uh, a chief <laughs> and not an Indian. Mm. Um, and so we have lots of fly by night uh, clubs. Everybody wants to be a chairman, you know, um, <clears throat> And we have, we have too many clubs uh, in the system. Um, and unfortunately, most of them are very centralized towards Johannesburg, Durban, and Cape Town. Uh, but you know, when you travel 50 minutes out of Johannesburg, there's very little organized football. You know, um, you, we, we, we have to, first of all, build facilities, um, in, implement sustainable uh, programs uh, and leagues, uh, get schools football back up and running, um, and so on and so forth. There's many elements to this this animal, uh, and we shouldn't really be looking at Bafana Bafana uh, or the PSL. Uh, the issue lies a lot deeper and and mostly at grassroots level and that's where we have to really put a lot of money and time uh into so that we can uh increase a pool of of players who will give the head coach of our national teams a real headache mm. uh, at this point in time uh, that doesn't happen no not and it's something like an, an academy would surely help you know because you mentioned schools there and I'm, I'm sort of in that environment. And I know there's a big draft towards rugby and cricket and the guys have got their high performance centers and they've got their academies and the guys are getting drilled day in and day out. And lo and behold, I look at the players that have been produced. I mean, it's excellent to see what they're doing. So do you think sort of like an involve of like a small soccer academies would help with that? Yeah. Um, so the, the rugby and cricket guys, um, you know, they generally come from a private school background or, or a university background. And um, there's a certain amount of um, high performance there in any case. <laughs> when, you, when you look at the rest of, when you look at soccer, for example, uh, most football players come from lower LSMs. Um, and so when we talk about academies, uh, often, when we talk about an academy, it's actually not an academy. An academy, in my mind, is um, a European or South American example where they take a Brazilian boy out of the favela uh, who shows talent and puts him in with a, um, uh, a mother and a father figure who feed him or her three meals a day. Uh, and he trains for, he or she trains for three to four hours in that day. Um, and gets a gets a good education as well, mm. a decent education. Uh, that that for me is an academy, and we actually don't 
don't have one of those in South Africa, as far as I know, apart from the IF Cape Town one, but they only have 20 kids in their academy, if I'm not mistaken. Mm. Um, so the School of Excellence was a perfect example of, of how it should be done. Uh, that unfortunately um, or closed down um, uh, when, when Transnet pulled out their sponsorship. Um, and for that short period of time, it generated an enormous amount of, of talent and professionals uh, and good professionals at it as well. So that is something that we have to uh, consider, but it is quite capital intensive and it has to be done properly. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, so not as easy as it sounds. Lots of work to be done. Lots of yeah. work to be done, yeah. Matt, um, tell us a bit about the, the Booth Foundation. How's that going? Yeah, so uh, we started that in 2009. Um, part of it, half of it is uh, our football clinics um, and the other half are book clubs. So um, basically what we do uh, with the football clinics is that we offer a three-hour uh, session at a private school, for example, and they will, they will pay. Um, I will get ex-professionals to come on board and we, we pay them a stipend to help out. We offer the kids lunch. And then that money is used to pay the coaches, but then also allows us to go to two or three um, uh, communities mm. or, or clubs um, or orphanages that would not be able to pay. And that kind of subsidizes our next two or three sessions. And I do the same thing. I offer them lunch. I bring ex-professionals ex on board who help out. Um, so we just attempt to give the kids uh, a, a professional experience, a nice training session with some something to eat, um, and and just to try and keep um, kids out of trouble and and to keep them encouraged uh, or enthusiastic about playing the game, mm. because we have, as you may well know, many depressed uh, areas in in the country. Um, I've. I've gone to uh, Mpangeni, uh, I've done stuff in Cape Town before, but most of uh, the work that we do uh, is up here in Gauteng. Okay. No, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Yeah, you're really giving back, Matthew. It's awesome because I believe you're also involved in, in drug-free sports. You drive that aspect quite hard, don't you? Yeah, so that um, we... Uh, I'm actually on the disciplinary committee panel uh, for the South African Institute for Drug-Free Sports. So those are the guys who, who test uh, all the athletes. And so normally the panels uh, are made up of lawyers and, and doctors. And so they've quite rightly included a couple of ex-athletes on the panels uh, to, to show a, a sympathetic uh, ear um, to the athletes who are accused of, of cheating. Um, <clears throat> And that in itself, I'm also on the uh, Premier Soccer League's disciplinary uh, committee panel, which is a bit ironic because I was uh, on the other side of the table quite often as well. <laughs> so I know, um, just from an educational point of view, learning about the legislation and, um, you know, the, the chemical compounds and, um, you know, the PSL handbook, etc. that's been an education, you know, so uh, I've been thoroughly enjoying that, yeah. No, uh, brilliant, brilliant. But one, something that I also found very interesting about you, Matthew, is that you're quite interested in, in about finances and getting people to understand how important it is to save during their career so that afterwards, you know, after your career is finished, you can keep on living. Is that something that's close to your heart as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, over the last decade, um, the, the plight of ex-players has been heightened. You know, there's been a lot of media attention about it. And it's... it's it's uh, quite disturbing the amount of my, the number of ex-colleagues who have fallen off on hard times. Um, during lockdown, myself, uh, Brian Beloy and Stanton Frederick started up the South African Football Legends, um, which is a platform which uh, we are hoping to, to offer a support base and uh, just bring back some of the, the ex-pros, you know, their dign dignity and uh, just get that banter and, and camaraderie back. Um, mm. Mm. And we we are actually in the process of um, searching for corporate sponsors. We've got a media partner on board, an apparel sponsor on board, and we want to uh, launch this year with some great uh, activations and a, and a three or four day launch. 
Um, and yeah, if, if people want to go check out what we're doing, uh, if I don't, if you don't mind me giving it a bit of a punt, it's uh, www.safl.coza, South African Football Legends. We're on all social media. There's some great content on there uh, from yesteryear. Uh, we've got the backing of the generation of 2000, which includes uh, Benny McCarthy and Quentin Fortune and Aaron McQuena. So hopefully we can get the ball rolling, so to speak, and um, uh, get, get, it, get it launched. Nah, that's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Well done. It's so good that guys keep other guys involved. I mean, the love for the sport can never die then. That's so good to see, Matthew. Well done. Absolutely brilliant. Matt, as you sort of draw towards an, an end, um, obviously you, you watch soccer. I mean, what else do you do anyway? No, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> you, do you obviously follow the Premier League quite closely, obviously in South Africa and England, or do you keep your eye on another league uh, at all? I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a West Ham uh, fan. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I, I, can hold, I can hold my head up high uh, for, for once. Um, <laughs> one of probably... A handful of West Ham fans in South Africa. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I watch I watch quite a bit of the the EPL. I must say, uh, I I do miss the atmosphere of the crowds, um, not being there. But you know, being being a fan of the local game as well, it's, it's it's quite nice that people are now just watching the game for what it is, and that that it's you you can you can now uh, come to a conclusion a clear conclusion about the quality of a game without being caught up in the, the sort of the crowd and the atmosphere um, that the local game has always had to compete against. Um, and the, the Puritans of the game can now sort of also just focus on the quality of, of a game. Um, so, yeah, I, the sooner we get the crowds back in, the, the better. But obviously, you know, yeah. we've, we've got to get rid of this uh, bloody pandemic. And, um, yeah, let's hope that we remain uh, sensible and wary. And, um, yeah, it will be um, a thing of the past uh, sooner rather than later. Absolutely. Well, like, just to echo what you're saying, at least we can watch sport and really see what's happening in the game and analyse it quite nicely as well. So it's... Yes, at least there has been live sport, but I definitely agree with you. It's not quite the same without the crowd. It's, yeah, it's not the same. But anyway, yeah. Matthew, you've been an absolute legend to chat to. Thank you so much for your insight and for giving us some good prospects about, about football as a whole and your career. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Cheers. No problem, Brian. Always a pleasure, man. Really appreciate your time, Matt. All the best. Cheers, man. Enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers, man. Mm-hmm.